Um, yeah, I guess first off, um, who knows what a microcontroller is? Okay, so quite a lot of you. But um, so for those who don't, it's pretty much a completely self-contained computer. Um, you know th that little chip that's up there. Um, you just you can pretty much just add power to it, and it's got everything it needs to run. It's got the read-only memory. It's got RAM. It's um, they've even usually got an oscillator in, so you know they'll just work. Um, these things are really popular. So um, ARM, who is just one manufacturer, they licensed 15 billion cores last year. So that's two for every person on the planet. So the real number of actual microcontrollers out there is probably several times higher than that. Um, so these things are very popular because they make life a lot simpler for people making stuff. So this is a digital clock made out of um, individual components. And you know it's it's really nice, but at the same time it must have taken weeks to design and make. And if you wanted to change some part of it, you know that's going to take a long time as well and a lot of parts. And if you're assembling this thing, the, those are all parts that you've got to buy, stock, solder, test. Um, it gets really complicated. If you had a microcontroller, you'd basically just get rid of all of the black components in there and just connect everything to one microcontroller in the middle. And then you could change how it worked just by changing a little bit of software. They are in use all over the place. And this was just like randomly looking around, trying to find some things that, um, that had them in. So I mean, uh, credit cards often have them in, um, torches, bike lights, remote controls, even power tools use them often for battery charging or controlling the motor. So if you wanted to get started yourself, um, I guess most people would, would know of this. This is the Arduino board. Um, the big black chip on there is a microcontroller. And um, you've got a bunch of other stuff there to make it easier to use. So you've got, in the bottom left, you've got the power supply. So you can run it off various different voltages. In the um, top left, you've got a USB interface, which is actually another more powerful um, microcontroller that has to handle USB. And then that takes data, and it's able to program the other microcontroller. So getting started with it looks a bit like this. Um, this is the Arduino IDE, a little piece of code that, um, that flashes the light on and off. If you hit the Upload button, it goes through a compiler on your PC, which creates binary code. And that binary code sent um, over USB to the first microcontroller, which then programmed the second. And then hopefully, it will start working. Now, as JavaScript developers, probably the first thing you notice is that there's a delay in there, which, you know, if that was in a web browser, that would totally kill stuff. And it's not a great deal better when you're trying to write code here, because if you want to now light two LEDs at different speeds, you're basically writing your own scheduler, um, which is not great. And like, if you're doing stuff with microcontrollers, quite often you want to do several things at once. Um, what makes this worse is that um, this isn't actually flashing as fast as you think, because there are other overheads involved in here. Um, you know, loop isn't called straight away. Um, digital write's got a bit of overhead. Um, but you also can't debug, at least not with um, the standard Arduino boards. So if this code doesn't work, you have a problem. You have to guess what, what happened or what went wrong. So I'm afraid this is a bit small. But this is an example of something I had a, a year or two ago. All I'm doing is printing hello with a slightly bigger than normal string. Um, and when you run it, it works. That's great. But if you now change that array and make it a little bit bigger, you haven't changed anything else, suddenly it just completely refuses to work. There are no errors, no nothing. It's still telling you it's got loads of memory free. Um, in fact, if you go and you change it and you make it even bigger, um, it'll start outputting the character 255, which is nowhere in your code at all. And you have no idea why. Um, so to be fair to Arduino, this is something that they have now fixed. But it's C code. So there are loads of other ways of making really unreliable stuff. Um, so I mean, probably not very many of you will have seen this. Um, 35 years ago in England, this was released. This was a BBC Micro, it's called. It was about 250 pounds then. So I guess it's probably 1,500 euros or so in today's money. Um, 
it was substantially less powerful, probably 10 times less power than that little chip that was on the tip of the finger at the start. Um, it's got about the same amount of RAM and flash memory in it. Um, and this thing managed to have a keyboard. It had a video output, and it had a basic interpreter. So if stuff went wrong, generally it would tell you where it went wrong. You could edit code on it, and it was, you know, it was actually a bit more pleasant to, um, to debug. So why can't you do something similar now? Well, it turns out you can. Um, this is called the Maximite. It's a, it's a really neat little thing. Um, and you know, it's got quite a large micro there, but um, just yeah, sitting in the middle of PCB doing everything, VGA output, keyboard input, um, and running BASIC. But BASIC's really, you know, it's a bit old now. Um, and it's not going to be much fun to do anything practical with. So if you could run JavaScript on this, um, it would be a lot better. You'd be able to write your Internet of Things service. You'd be able to write JavaScript on the server in Node.js. You'd be able to write it on the client. You'd be able to write it on the actual embedded device that was running off a battery somewhere and, and sending your data back. And if you had some algorithm that you'd written, you'd be able to, um, to basically just copy it from one place to the other without having to rewrite it in a different language and potentially introduce bugs. Um, the event-based nature of JavaScript also makes it really quite good for low-power stuff. Um, so the obvious question is, why don't you just use a Raspberry Pi? Because it runs Linux, you can stick Node.js on it, and you can write your software that way. And you can. It's a great idea. But what it's not good at is battery-powered stuff. Um, so you know, in the RAM alone, you've probably got 2 billion transistors that you've got to keep refreshing every so often. That uses quite a lot of power. So even when it's idling, you're looking at between 50 and 200 milliamps, depending on the model of Raspberry Pi you've got, which is not going to last for a large time on a battery. So by comparison, um, this is Esprino running on a, um, uh, I think it's a EFM32 chip. But um, this is a logarithmic scale showing power usage over time. It's running a really simple bit of code that's, um, that's turning one LED on, turning another LED on, both LEDs, and then nothing. Um, so you can see it's sitting there and it's drawing, I don't know, like three microamps. Um, so that's a lot less than the Raspberry Pi anyway. And then it can it spike up a little bit, maybe to 20 milliamps while it's executing code. And then it jumps back down. And that half milliamp there is just the LED turning on. Um, and then you've got the other LED and then both LEDs, so it jumps up to one milliamp and then down again. Um, so the Raspberry Pi, between working and not working, it'll be using maybe two times as much power. This thing is, you know, it's like possibly 10,000 times less power when it's sleeping than when it's awake. And that means that you can actually have it running off a battery for a, a large amount of time, like years, depending on the battery. Um, so this is one of those devices that runs JavaScript. It's called the Esprino Pico. It's got a, um, the same chip that you saw earlier on it, um, and the JavaScript interpreter is on that chip. So um, the other thing is, it's got a USB interface right on the end of it. Um, the USB is actually handled by the same chip. You don't need two chips. Because you're running the JavaScript interpreter, you can effectively segregate the code that you're running and the code that's needed to interface to USB. And you can make sure that USB is always there. So um, you plug it in, and it should appear as a USB communication port. Uh, so if I go to um, here. With a normal terminal application on pretty much anything, um, you should be able to slash connect. OK, and now you have a basically a REPL um, that lets you interact directly with the device. So um, you can, for instance, um, ask it to add some numbers together or ask it what its temperature is. Um, and it's got, you know, it's got command completion and um, command history. And that's all happening just completely in the chip. All you need is a very simple serial connection to it. Um, so to be honest, this is um, a bit hard to show you up here. So if I try and connect with, this is the, um, we call it the Web IDE. It's, uh, it runs in Chrome. And because it says a Chrome app, at the moment it gets permission so that it can access the serial port. Um, so you get exactly the same thing. Um, but what it does have is the ability to hopefully show you what's going on. Um, 
So yeah, we, we can write commands. We can say things like led.set, um, and it will light the LED up. We can um, use commands that are a bit easier to, um, to understand for people who are used to Arduino, like digital write. So um, if we, we uh, try and toggle it, so we'll make an array, uh, sorry, we'll make a variable, um, and actually, that's going to work. Let's wrap that in function. OK, so now if we call it, hopefully it will toggle that light on and off. Um, we, can, we can use something like set interval to make that happen in the background. Now, it, it isn't itself multitasking, but um, like Node, it's executing a series of small tasks one after the other. Um, so even though it's doing this now, we can, um, we can still go into here and we can actually change the function while it's running. And maybe we want to light the other LED up as well. Um, let's go back and just turn that off. But you know, this isn't very useful. It's just lighting lights up. You can do that on the computer. If you wanted to light something else up, it's just a matter of plugging it into the pins. So this is a button and a light. Um, if I plug this in, um, so it's connected to two pins called B3 and B4. So if we said, um, in fact, let's just go up here and change this to B3. And hopefully, that will start flashing. Um, so we can, uh, we can write analog values to it, do all kinds of stuff like that. You know, we can read the value of the button and make stuff happen when you press the button. And this is all happening completely without the PC. I could save this, um, plug it into an external power source, and it would keep doing exactly the same thing that it's currently doing. Um, so this can be, can be useful. Um, for instance, if you wanted to um, make a build light to warn you when your build was failing, um, you know, this code is um, you, you're just sending straight JavaScript commands to it. So um, you can actually do that with the echo command. Uh, so if I write echo digital write, um, and then just send that to the board. Oops. OK, now this isn't going to work because it's flashing at the moment. So we'll just have to step back and um, reset it. So now, um, if I turn it on, it should light the light up. Um, but we can use um, the kind of the standard bits of bash. So we can use the error code of running the last command. At the moment, everything is going, to going great, so the light's going to be off. But suppose you ran your build, and it failed, and it set an error code. Now, next time you run it, it's going to turn the light on. And this required no software on here at all. You'd just get it out, plug it in, and it would, would do this. You know, one line of code, and you've managed to control something from your PC. However, the problem is, what happens next year when Apple decide to remove all the ports? Um, so this is where Bluetooth Low Energy comes in. Um, Bluetooth Low Energy wasn't originally Bluetooth. It was created by Nokia um, some time ago and then pulled into the Bluetooth spec a few years ago. It's a very low energy radio that runs on the same frequency as Bluetooth, so it can share the same um, aerial. But it, it doesn't really work the same way, and it's a lot less complicated. Um, so it's now in pretty much everything um, you might buy, you know, uh, laptops, phones, tablets. Um, and the really nice thing is that Chrome is now pushing forward with support to add a JavaScript API for it called Web Bluetooth. This means that from a website, um, in the same way that you might ask for permissions to use a camera, you can ask for permissions to use a Bluetooth low energy device. Um, so you can write truly multi-platform stuff that will run and will access real hardware. So um, as a quick example of this, let's go back and um, OK, sorry, missed the slide. Um, so as an example of this, um, this is a little um, BB-8 toy. Now, probably if you'd installed the application for this toy on your Android phone, it would have used up you know, maybe 20, 30 megabytes of, of space just for like random images. 
this is going to be a website that's like 10K, if that, um, that you can just go to and you can use it straight away. All kinds of Bluetooth Low Energy devices, um, so Bluetooth Low Energy printers, um, light bulbs, all kinds of toys, um, sockets that you can turn on and off can all be done from the internet. So it would be really nice if you could take the same kind of um, JavaScript that, um, that I had there and actually access it completely over Bluetooth Low Energy as well. Um, you can do that. So I've come up with this um, thing called PuckJS, which is just a Bluetooth module um, on a board like with a, in a nice holder with a battery and some sensors. It's got a magnetometer in there, so it can measure magnetic fields. Um, it's also got some lights, it's got an infrared transmitter, so you can use it to control your TV, um, and you can, you can measure light and some other stuff. So, um, yeah, so what's it like to use? So I shall just um, stick the battery in this. Okay, so hopefully, if I take my phone um, and I go to a, um, this is just a really basic website. Um, I'll just flash up the code in a few seconds. Um, but all it does is it should send a command to the puck. Now, if I choose this and pair, and <laughs> you can't see it because of the lights. Okay, so. And it now, you know, it's, it's pretty much instant once it's connected to control it. Um, so this is working by, where are we? So um, this isn't the exact code, but effectively um, there's a little library that handles the Bluetooth low energy side. Um, but that in itself isn't very complicated, but all you have to do is send strings of JavaScript code directly to it, and you can execute them. So in the same way, you can send code that will make it flash or will make it um, do some reading of the magnetometer or anything else. Um, but it's not just that. You can actually um, program it and debug it completely wirelessly as well. So um, on Linux, it turns out Bluetooth Low Energy Web Bluetooth is, is a little bit flaky, so I have a hack around it um, for this talk because it's just going to break. So, oops. Um, in exactly the same way, it's it's now connected. Um, let's get rid of that. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, we, we can do all the previous stuff that we did, um, but we can also use the magnetometer. So if I, um, I'll just get rid of this for now. So this is a function that it will get called with uh, just a simple object containing x, y, and z. Um, and we'll just turn the magnetometer on. Um, so you've got the left-hand side, which is just a REPL, and then the right-hand side, which is um, uh, which is like a proper syntax highlighted editor. Just a second. Okay. Um, so I've, um, I've just taken a paper clip and stuck it on the back of this, and um, I'm going to put it on this glass. Now, I've got a ping pong ball here with a magnet on the bottom of it. So hopefully, if I bring this near, we'll start to see those values change. Um, so at the moment, they're big and negative, but if I bring this close, we'll see the Y value goes quite positive. Um, and then when it's low in here, it'll go negative again. So it would be quite easy to tell whether, we're, um, whether the water level is high or not just by checking whether y is greater than 0 or not. So we can go in here, um, 
Let's use that digital right again. Whoops. Um, and again, we can just maybe change the function on the fly. So hopefully, now, um, hopefully people will be able to see this, but if I bring this close, it's going to work. Oh, hang on. Yeah, there you go, brilliant. Um, so lighting and lights are not that useful. This has a radio on it. We can we can do something a bit more interesting with this. Um, what we can actually do is broadcast a advertisement. So um, Bluetooth Low Energy Beacons, um, again, Google have a standard for this called Eddystone. Um, if you broadcast data in a certain format, um, Android phones will pick it up um, and they will display a notification which lets you then tap that and go to the website. Um, so we can, we can just do that. So if I um, change this code, or just pull this back in. Oops. Um, and then we want, to, um, we want to stop it advertising if the water level is low. So hopefully, if I disconnect now, um, let's clear this and try and get it to a decent picture of the phone. So just to force this, um, I actually have an, an app that will let me kind of force it to check, sorry, um, force it to make sure if there are beacons or not. So if I put this in here, hopefully nothing will happen yet. But if I fill it up, is it going to work? This is definitely the problem with live demos. Yeah, OK. <laughs> so if I force this to check, this is where it all falls down. Ah, oh, come on. OK, you'll have to trust me on this. It worked just a few minutes ago. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it should be um, this easy. You've got um, uh, not only the, the way that you can advertise stuff with it, but you can, um, you can make it into a uh, Bluetooth Low Energy human interface device, like a keyboard or a um, volume control. So you can make it start or stop your music, change the volume, change your slides. Um, you can make it print the text. Um, maybe you want it to print the current temperature when you press the button, and it can do that perfectly fine. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's all um, really promising. And being able to do this directly from a website um, on many different platforms. So right now, it works perfectly on Chromebook. It works perfectly on Mac OS and on Android. Um, and early next year, it's getting enabled without you having to use flags in any of the browsers. It's already shipping in all the browsers um, that are out there. Um, Windows will be coming early next month. Um, so uh, yeah, first quarter of 2017. Um, and Linux kind of works, um, but it'll, it'll just take a few months for um, up-to-date versions of the packages to kind of get into all the main distributions. Um, so, um, so by itself, this doesn't um, doesn't connect to the internet. There is IPv6, which is already part of the spec, which hopefully will get added to PuckJS soon. Um, there's also something called HTTP proxy that lets it connect um, and request web pages and push data up. You know, it's not just lights. There's loads and loads of stuff you can add to this. So, a um, bunch of displays, um, radios. Uh, you know, you've got GPS, um, you've got low gas sensors, basically, you know, the Wiimote, anything you can think of. Um, you can attach it to um, Ethernet, GSM, um, 
uh, Wi-Fi, everything's open source, software, hardware, um, even documentation. And I basically, I work on this full time and it's, it's paid for by um, Kickstarter campaigns that I've run for these kind of boards and also just selling the boards. Um, while I sell them, it's open source, so it's available for a whole bunch of other stuff. This is actually, these are just the boards I have in my shelf. There are loads more that are supported. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's a great thing to have a play with. Um, and hacking around with hardware is really, really good fun. Um, you should definitely get started with it. And while you can get going with something like Arduino, you'll actually have a lot of fun just playing with Esprino on whatever board you choose to use it on, whether it's one of the official boards or something like Node MCU. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's great fun. Anyway, thanks for, for listening. Thank you,